in American Sign Language, where you double mark mm -hmm. um, the, the this no and this no, yeah. how do you ever uh, explain Try to. How do you ever violate the truth value of a sentence that has a negative element in it? You mean like how do you express the double it, negation? It is not true that John didn't come. Right. So I don't know how this works in all the in negative counter languages in general. In general, because that's really the problem. But there's there are lots of sort of more complicated grammatical structures you could put together. There's, in ASL specifically, there's also a manual sign. Or there's an actual manual sign for, for not. not. Yeah. yeah. And so, so you can put that in terms of sentence while you're both doing this. And that's true. Yeah, that's pretty ill form to just put that. Yeah. It's not true that you have none. Yeah. Or how many of like, you make something like, do you have none? No. You make some kind of question like structure. But yeah, um, in the case of the ASL, there's also a manual sign. So you can. So there are two ways of answering yes no questions in languages, one is to say yes and no relative to the proposition expressed as opposed to, mm -hmm. is, it, I take it this is the same, roughly the same question. Ah, yes. I have, we just have a paper on that. Oh, well. Uh, yes. <laughs> and my last about the polarity uh, yeah. alignment of ASL. Which, which is ASL? So you can get, it's kind of, so in English you can get both basically, right? So you can, you can say, is it raining? No. Is, are, are, you, are you not coming tomorrow? And I can well, say, only that if are you not coming, but not aren't you coming? You, right. you don't get you know, Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are you not coming tomorrow? Yes. I'm not well, used coming. Used to be no. and nay, which you used to do the same thing as yes and no, but we don't have a C, unfortunately. Right. We don't have the third answer protocol. Sorry. Um, so ASL is. Yeah. So. To get the, <laughs> it's, it's a little. If you want to ask the question with no, like is Mary coming? Do you and she is coming? Do you say no? She is coming or yes? She is coming. Is it Mary? No, you have to ask a negative question, right? So is, it, is Mary not is coming? It, yeah. Okay. Is it Mary coming? Uh, you can. You most want to align with the polarity, but you yeah. can also make it sort of the other way around, where if you ask like a question and comment, if you want to change the scope structure, basically. Um, yeah. It, so it's a little bit more like Japanese <laughs> than it is like English, but it can also do the English like thing sometimes, is the short answer. It doesn't actually relate to the, I mean, it's all exactly the same topic as this, um, but you, can use more like a manual sign with the um, Yeah, this is kind of a follow-up. It, it relates to not the uh, answers to negative questions, but to the expression of double negation versus negative concord. In in negative in, in some negative concord languages, and certainly in non-standard English, um, and maybe child English too, uh, a cue is um, the intonation. Uh, and so, in particular, there's Wait, a difference between yeah. So, <laughs> so, so there's a difference between um, I didn't do nothing and I didn't do nothing. Yeah. Uh, and and you know that that one works pretty clearly. But but also a lot of your data with with any uh, you, where you were saying that for adult speakers you can get the free choice reading. Free choice any tends to have to be stressed. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I suspect that the any that the children are producing is more like the, the no, which is not necessarily stressed. Um, I, I want any, as opposed to I want any, uh, where I want any could be free choice, but I want any is really impossible in, in adult English, you know, whatever the context is. I do but have a good answer to this, okay. <laughs> which is that it's neither of those. Okay. So the free choice, you're right, you can tell. Like, I want any. You mm -hmm. might even gesture with it, you know, it has a different intonation than the NPI, mm -hmm. but it seems more like an emphatic, like I, like in the I don't want none, I want any, mm -hmm. emphatically meaning none, right? Mm -hmm. So it's emphatic, but it doesn't have that sort of, in this, not in the same way as a free choice. Somebody should measure that better, but yeah, my, my, and, 
tuition and also like the... So that sort of goes along with the cabinet and land and widening uh, idea of any, that, that any widens the domain to consider mm -hmm. alternatives that previously were not. Included. Yeah. Okay. okay, we had the Garrett had his, his hand up and then we'll get to everybody. <laughs> Chris, you meant up. So I don't know if this makes sense. It's like the name of everything. I was wondering about the two hypotheses you have at the end. Uh -huh. Is there a certain hypothesis, hypothesis that the kids are kind of accommodating to the way that the speakers, to the informativeness of the speakers? So it's not that they're punishing or they're motivated to help, but they're kind of saying, okay, well, this is how you did it, so I'm going to kind of accommodate to this kind of level of, um, or this means of being informative. Well, I guess to my mind, accommodation has to have like some sort of uh, material triggers and that's why we made sure that the clues that the two speakers gave were identical in form so no, that, um, yeah. yeah we it wasn't the case that the, the one was using adjectives and the other one was no, not no. so in that sense it cannot be that type of accommodation but be fairly abstract. there yeah. is this idea that maybe they're sort of paying back mm -hmm. the partner uh, yeah because it costed them some stickers, so... Um. Just a follow-up uh, uh, question. So I love the study, but I'm trying to think of whether there is any simpler, dumb explanation for the outcome. Mm -hmm. And one possibility may be that, as you said, uh, when you're interacting with an informative speaker, your communication is likely to be successful. Mm -hmm. When you're talking to an unhelpful person, your, your outcome of communication is really bad. So you don't have to remember anything about informativeness, but if so, the memory of having successful conversation with this person, but not with this person, mm -hmm. might just predict the same thing. So what do, they, do they actually know anything about informativeness? Well, I guess um, our informativeness rating test sort of says that they do make the distinctions between the two, so... Right, but the distinction may be that, well, this person... Would, help me. Yeah. With the existence of this person, I got the sticker. Right. With this person, so, I didn't get a sticker. This is certainly a caveat to mm -hmm. this because this was informativeness that affected the child itself. So mm -hmm. informativeness and helpfulness are not teased apart here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it would be interesting right. to see if they would do the same if it was a third party interaction which they happened to witness and in which they didn't have any personal cost. Um, yeah, but um, sorry, but I, I think it's still there, right? Like informativeness and reward mm -hmm. are completely mm -hmm. not piece of art. So we're yes. just trying to think whether there's any way. Yeah, um, I don't know if it is if your explanation is different than how I am thinking about it. So I'm not, I, I, I'm not sure what the nature of this effect is. I know that we see this in. Uh, collaborative behaviors, for example, uh, this type of uh, distinction between helpful, cooperative partners versus defectors, uncooperative right. partners, but... Um, yeah, I don't know whether there's any easy answer, but I'm just wondering whether kids are doing any causal inference as to why this communication was successful, mm -hmm. and for a specific right. reason, I got this paper. So, right. I mean, it's a, a next step question, right. I guess. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. yeah. Is it, yeah. Uh, I have a question related to relations. Uh, apart from the sign language, another gestures or facial expressions help in that because they can also be cues. Yeah, I mean they certainly help with rejection. <laughs> in fact, usually kids are expressing it. Like, you know, <laughs> not with words. Uh, and so then I think also emptiness, not, I mean, a lot of sign languages, the words for sort of negative quantifiers very similar to this, um, you know, not. and so those kind of gestures I think people produce all the time. So in terms of like aids to learning this concept, for the first, first projection, sort of concept of emptiness, I think it does help a lot. Like, but then when you think about like, how do you figure out something like a negation of the proposition that you're trying to say, it's true that like we any or some I don't know some facial expressions like moving eyebrow yeah in terms well, of like what aids the child concept. probably like everything else even there's lots of cues but, yeah do they ever say I want any 
Or they're shaking. Oh, they're going to shake. Or they're going like this. Those are two perfectly good negations that go with right. the, the word. I, this is just a... Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. I mean, you, you don't have question, tapes right? of them. Um, I should see if some of the childless ones are, are linked to the video. I didn't look. Um, I mean, they, could, they so, could also turn know, their body away. I mean, there are various ways of showing negation. Right, right, right. In I a mean, generic, sorry, in a utterance length way. Yeah, I mean, all of that kind of comes into like, what, how are the kids interpreting it? And so, like Lynn's coding, for example, she, she was trying to find like not, that this isn't you know she's sort of using whatever else is available in the context, the follow-up sentence, whatever cues are in the you know recording and things like that. Presumably, also gesture if there's video. The idea that let's figure out what the interpretation is. I guess that often's in play, including the context of like literally, like literally the bag is empty. Um, so I guess it's the question of like how do kids learn that? I don't know which cues are important. They're but talking to you. You're, they're using a hell of a lot of gestures. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we have a couple more questions here, so we want to make sure that we get to this. Person. Yeah. Thank you. So. With, with the task um, with the kids are helping the puppets, um, how do we know whether the kids are just kind of copying or modeling whichever kind of puppet they got? Because maybe they see the puppet as a kind of authority figure in that scenario, or whether they're um, not just copying but thinking about like the informative, informativeness of the interaction they had. Um. Well, I guess th this is a similar question to what Gareth mm -hmm. asked before. So, um, I don't think they're modeling per se, because um, as I mentioned before, the you know uh, external characteristics of the um, utterances that the puppets used were the same, were the same for both types of speakers. Um, so whether you know they want to uh, do the same thing that the puppet did to them, this is um, an open question. But it, it's a question. Did you still have a question? Sorry, yes. I had a comment about negation. So if I understood your hypothesis, it's that when you have I didn't use any um, children sort of ignore the things and think that the negation comes from the end. And so they interpret right, it as right, not right. right? Right. And I mean, the, what's wondering with their indirect support for that is what we know about languages that when they have, when the negative marker is higher mm -hmm. in the cause of structure, then a negative marker is obligatory. But when, and the negative marker always tends to be uh, phonetically reduced, mm -hmm. right? Whereas when the negative marker is lower in the structure, closer to the DP, mm -hmm. The negative comfort is either impossible, but most likely it's most most cases it's not obligatory, and the negative marker tends to not be reduced. It's a nicht or nicht or yeah. So I wonder whether um, the two things go together, right? The, the sort of ability or you know strategy of ignoring the negative marker when it's higher and taking the NPI to be a negative quantifier. It's just a suggestion. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. I mean, it kind of going into Larry's discussion about the asymmetry, but not just in terms of the an object, but was it like causal engagement yeah. or something? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems like maybe what kids are doing is like building up something functional, sort of in the VP. Okay, what in my event talking about eating nothing versus so what is the what is the event kind of thing that we're talking about eating nothing or not. You know, the absence of cookies, cookies having none of them, or something like that, or not having cookies. I don't, I mean, this is total speculation, but in terms of like thinking about the child like, cognitive development with the potential language structures they're mapping to it, maybe if they, that other stuff seems somehow like functional and something about, you know, the tense and other things. Depending on the clause type, if it's like you know subjunctive, it's just much more functional. It's stuff that kids can have a lot of hard time with, and also in English, it's on the auxiliary. If I ignore, I don't know what that word means. Um, and there, I think that makes a lot of predictions that that are nice because we could test them, and we haven't done that yet at all. So um, that's another tie-in that I hadn't thought about. That, so thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, we um, we got quite off schedule this afternoon. Um, it's okay. We are. We'll take you away from the party. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we do still have another five minutes to this twenty-minute discussion section, then. And so we have one question here, one question here, and one question here. Starting with this one. Thank you. I'm working from a computer system, and I think the intuition is right. It's already data based, so Gibbs and Nielsen. just wanted to create a situation where we had uh, taken as a fact that the one is informative, the other is under informative, and then we wanted to see whether these inferences would affect their subsequent behavior. Uh, but we're definitely interested in seeing how, um, you know, whether these inferences are truly about informativeness and uh, yeah, when they break apart. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I think I've seen it. Um, Catherine, I was thinking you might want to look at the dissertation by one of Alia Morgenstern's um, uh, students. I think her name is Sophie Kayet. And what she did was track all the forms of negation, gestural and verbal, in an English speaking child in Britain and I think also in a couple of French speaking children in Paris. And one of the things she found was the very first of all was turning the head away, pushing away. Um, you know, leaning backwards till you practically fall over <laughs> uh, as a negative. <laughs> um, but what is nice in French, of course, is if you uh, don't use the ne, the negative part, the other form is still completely negative and it's completely standard. So, je veux rien, I don't want anything. Um, J'ai vu personne, I, I didn't see anyone. Um, so those forms don't come over as the, like the any does in English at all. Um, you have continuity as the as the negative system gets elaborated. Yeah, that system seems, I guess, under my developing view of this, that seems like an easier system for kids to yes. learn, right? So it's like, okay, they have the, the stages, and that makes sense, and then you could expand from what you know about Rien to like, Neng, okay, then, this, then I can figure out what that means, it can help me more, more complicated clauses. The English seems like a tricky. Yeah, the English is, is more complicated. Yeah, yeah. and yes. then I guess you have a story about any and None and some, and when you can use it. Thank you, that, that sounds like a very cool data source. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to our last question. Jeez, we're on the spot now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I'm just curious about uh, the study with uh, the sort of uh, retribution with the children are doing. <laughs> uh, I wonder what, what happens with adults, and maybe uh, there are also cross linguistic differences in the expressivity of these kinds of situations. Like uh, if you have a certain language where you can't give as much information as you might like, or you give too much by default, then maybe people are better at it. But uh, do, do adults? maintain this hatred for those who do not uh, give them as much information as they desire? Or? Well, I, I don't think this has been done with information, um, but um, I'm sure it has been done with other types of resources or even money, and uh, yeah, so adults definitely uh, respect the, um, you know, these norms of uh, you know uh, distributing benefits equally and not having someone being a detector and um, but, but I know in those cases it, it's actually variable uh, across cultures. So uh, there are certain groups that uh, are more uh, 
it exert more pain on those who violate. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm yes. sure. Uh, yeah. I uh, I don't know. Um, I, I know that there is that this literature is also being done, um, you know, cross culturally, but I'm I'm not sure what the findings are. There's there's huge. Yeah.